Well, good evening and welcome everybody. We're glad that you're here. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. And I'm gonna open up in prayer and then turn it over to one of our CFA members, uh, Steve Terry. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks for this opportunity to gather tonight and to continue to learn about stewardship and the mission and ministry of Eastern Pennsylvania. God, I give you thanks for all of the leaders in Eastern Pennsylvania, for their commitment, for their continued service. And God, I give thanks for those who are with us tonight to learn more about all the things you want to do in and through us. Now, God, bless our time together. All this we pray in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. And I turn it to Steve Cherry, the, one of our Council on Finance and Administration members. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm uh, here at the bidding of Irene Dickinson, Chair of Council on Finance Administration, because she is unable to be at the meeting. She's traveling. So it falls to me then to just introduce uh, us to the conversation for the evening. Um, and so I'll say a couple of opening, I'll have a couple of opening remarks. And then Joe Fielding, our CFO, will speak to details um, about the, the new budget so that we all can be prepared for Saturday's uh, adjourned session of the annual conference. So uh, just to begin, uh, it's probably a good thing that we took extra time following the May uh, uh, sessions of annual conference, uh, because this has provided the opportunity for us to uh, make some refinements, uh, clarify some of the understanding, have more time to talk to you, uh, members of the annual conference, and to provide these sessions, for example, where we uh, can listen and have listened to uh, many of the questions and concerns and thoughts. So, um, but in truth, the new budget format is a major, major, major undertaking. And uh, it has given pause to many persons because it's a lot to understand. Uh, it is, we believe, a good format that will um, help us build uh, for the future. But uh, the truth uh, remains that it's been uh, a, a tough journey, and it will continue to be a tough journey as we move into uh, a, a new year with um, our eyes on our fiscal stewardship. Uh, tremendous amount of thanks goes to those persons who have worked on the various aspects of the budget and uh, brought it to a final form, and in particular, Joe Fielding, our CFO, staff persons, uh, members of all the commissions who are involved for the uh, uh, collaborations that have happened for the budget. So uh, anyway, so I, I have uh, three things, three reasons why I think this is a good new way to understand budget for Eastern Pennsylvania. And um, three reasons why this is a good thing for us to do. The first is transparency. So this format allows the annual conference to see the entire financial picture for the, the fiscal dealings of the annual conference and its various agencies. So it allows everyone to uh, you know, learn details about all areas of the budget. I think it will probably take several years for us to perfect all the nuances of the budget, but this will be a tool uh, and a platform on which we can build for the future and uh, address very difficult times for, for the church. Uh, it'll, it'll provide the right uh, a way for there to be uh, good conversations, uh, good questions, and um, sharing in the struggles as we move into the future. That's the first reason, transparency. The second um, is uh, the variety of funds. This budget addresses the variety of funds, the different uh, funds that we have uh, 
uh, and have had for a long time. It's a mix of estate bequests and restricted funds, as well as funds that are designated for a specific use. We've known about the funds, we hear about them now and then, but this budget provides a way for us to see with detail what the funds are, their values, how they'll be used, and uh, mechanisms for us to work the funds and make decisions about the best way uh, to utilize the content of the funds. This is so that we can be faithful to the intent of donors when that's the case, or be faithful to how a particular fund is supposed to work, and it allows everyone to be in on the conversation. So it's a good thing. The third reason why I think this is a good budget platform is it helps everyone see the big picture. Um, so all together, we get to see all of the um, areas uh, of the annual conferences activity. And um, uh, quite frankly, it, it is a, a way for everyone to be engaged and involved. Um, obviously, this probably means for all of you uh, more work to understand the budget, more time spent to pay attention to the uh, particulars of this area or that area. We tend to have our favorite areas of ministry and mission, but uh, it is important for annual conference members who are stewards of the entire business and work and mission and ministry of the annual conference. So, so uh, one last thing I want to say is that uh, we decided to change the nomenclature and are calling uh, this a, a comprehensive budget which suggests that it is a gathering of all the information for everyone to understand. It does not mean that everyone puts all their money into one pot and you have to fight to get uh, something for a particular mission or ministry. So um, certainly we want everyone to be able to comprehend the budget and uh, to understand it and to embrace it and uh, to move forward. Everyone, I think, understands that this is a critical time for the church. The pressures against church um, and how we've done things are great. And there's a, an increasing need for us to be, uh, to think creatively and outside the box. It's also important for us to think carefully about all of our financial resources and how they're structured and how they're utilized this budget will help us do this into the future. So thanks for listening. I want to turn it over to Joe to give us a uh, detail about the numbers. Thank you, Steve. So before um, I start and show you the budget, there are a couple things I wanted to go over with you. Um, Steve mentioned the first one about changing the name from a consolidated budget to a comprehensive budget. Um, I know that when the information went out to everyone um, for tonight's meeting, it included schedules, um, and I'm not sure if it included a red line version of the, of the budget or not, but it included schedules that were out of date. So don't even look at the schedules that were attached to your um, meeting notice for tonight. If you need to see the schedules, you can go out to the website and see them there. Um, the only things that have changed for connectional ministry is making sure that the naming of certain areas reflected EPA um, naming. Um, so uh, Journey of Hope was changed to um, the, the uh, Healing the Wounds of Racism core team and stuff like that. So if you need to see that, it's out there. Uh, really, the only changes to numbers for the budget occurred in benefits and trustees, and I'm going to go over them with you tonight. Um, just wanted to give you a little bit of knowledge about what the assumptions were that we used when we were going through and creating this budget. The first is that we changed the formula for calculating the shared services or shared um, ministry from 9.5% uh, to 9.8%. And the reason we did that was that CFA looked at... Um, the formula, they looked at the, what we had to do um, to repay the Boy Scouts of America settlement. 
Um, and we looked at the fact that the general church fund percentage went down from last year. And so we felt it was a good idea to put that as part of this formula so that we could um, pay back this Boy Scouts of America settlement um, in a way that was just to all the churches. So the Boy Scouts of America settlement is um, somewhere around 590,000. Um, and we had decided that we were going to pay that back over a three year period, a third each year, build out to local churches. Um, then we found out that the um, survivors were unable to touch any of that money until the entire fund was funded in whole. And so CCFA made the decision to go ahead and pay that upfront um, in September. So we'll be paying that out, out of our operating expenses for September. Um, and then we will still continue to bill it out to local churches one third over three years and pay back that operating fund. So that's the first assumption. The second assumption is that um, we wanted to provide an increase to our staff and we put in a 4% increase um, as part of the budget. And the reason for that is that over the years we've had sort of an unwritten policy of a 3% increase every other year, um, which kind of puts us out of sync with what's happening in the world. Um, but also as soon as we have a salary that study and we get ourselves to a point where we think that we're um, on even uh, keel, we uh, immediately go out of sync the next year when we don't have an increase. So um, we want to make sure that we're increasing appropriately for our staff. So 4% was put into this budget. And then finally, um, we wanted to um, make sure that we could, could take a specific draw on our funds and we elected a 5% draw this year. Um, and in future, um, we will have an investment committee who will be um, checking out the, the rate of return on our investments and monitoring that. Um, they'll meet twice a year with their managers. They'll um, discuss amongst themselves and get information from the fund committee as to how those funds are being used and whether it's an appropriate uh, amount that's being taken. And then they will actually, um, in the future, decide what that percentage of a draw will be. So let me uh, get out of here and share the screen with you. Okay, hopefully everyone can see my screen. So what we had heard from um, members is that they wanted to be able to see um, all of the different areas that roll up into the comprehensive budget total. And uh, so that's what we've been spending our time since annual conference um, uh, in May, working to put that together. Um, it's really, I think, a very good way of looking at it. Um, so we have the trustees, the benefits, camping, um, and then all of um, the connectional ministry pieces. Um, as I said, none of the um, connectional ministry pieces changed in their amounts. Basically, what we've changed is that we now show across the board shared ministry apportionment. So each area receives a portion of that shared ministry that we collect. But what also we are showing is the uncollectibles. And we have not really shown this well in the past. So this is an opportunity for you as members to see what's really happening with an annual conference. Um, in the past, all you saw was sh the uh, CMF portion. So you didn't see what was happening with all the other areas. Um, and you can see that we have approximately $1.7 million in uncollectibles, which is completely unsustainable. So the way this works for camping is that um, they now receive what looks like a much larger amount for um, camping from shared ministries. So they're part of the whole now. They get a piece of that shared ministries. Um, but what you need to also see is that they also get a portion of the uncollectibles. So the 74,660 gets subtracted out of the 497. And then the other piece is that um, this 84,103 down at the bottom, was, which is their percentage of the general administration budget. 
So um, that pays for resources, um, the financial platform, the uh, payroll piece, all of that gets rolled into that figure. So once you subtract that out, it actually ends up being pretty much the same as what they would have gotten before, which was 275,000. It's actually about 2,500 more. Um, what we can say is that in the future, if we ended up being able to uh, bring this uncollectibles down, they would get more in their um, camping budget. And so that's definitely one of our goals is to make sure that we clean up that uncollectibles and can use all of this money for ministry instead. The next piece is the uh, Board of Benefits. And um, and I should say I've met with all of these different groups and they've all approved their portion of the budget. So none of this is a, is a surprise. Um, they've all um, seen it and, and okayed it. Um, what we're seeing here is that this is the largest portion of our uncollectibles is in, in the billings is for benefits. So it's um, health, pension, um, death and disability, all of that rolled up into here. In order to make sure that we can meet our expense portion of this, we have to increase the amount that's billed out um, to, to members. Now, this is something that we absolutely need to move the needle on. We need to make sure that churches are paying their fair share. If they have a pastor who's in the health plan, they need to pay the composite rate for the health plan. Um, you know, it's something that um, is so important. Um, and, and while we, we love the fact that we're a connectional ministry and can support each other uh, in all of these areas, we also need to hold each other accountable. And we need to make sure that we are supporting all the way across the board. Um, and so that churches who maybe have a larger budget um, and who are able to um, afford their um, pension and benefits a little bit better are not being harmed by having to pay higher and higher costs each year in order to cover churches who are not paying in full or are not paying at all. The other piece here is the um, 349,881 is, um, it, it represents a 5% draw from all of the benefit funds. We had actually um, intended not to draw from one of those funds for this year, but after looking at the amount of uncollectible, we felt that it, it made more sense for us to take a 5% draw for everything so that we could help to cover those costs. Um, and so that's where we are with benefits. For trustees, um, this is probably the one area where if you are looking at the schedules, you'll see a little bit of a difference. And that's because I was able to put in accurate figures um, for many of the areas, including the property and liability, because uh, we got those figures after the May annual conference. So these are actual figures that are in here. Um, but the biggest piece is the fact that I made an error in my calculation. Um, and so I had actually made the calculation on the schedule. And then when I moved it over to the budget piece, I did it again. So this actually represents a $600,000 decrease, um, which brings our um, total budget down to 19,480,750. Um, our expenses are 19,477,499, which leaves a much less surplus, but a little bit of a surplus of 3,251. And of course that will be more if we get more people paying for the things that they're being billed for. Um, I think that's all I have. I can leave this up uh, for just a couple of minutes. If uh, you wanna put any questions in the chat or um, raise your hand and let us know that you would like to speak, I'll be able to take any questions. Um, Steve can answer questions. And I think I saw that there were some other CCFA members who are on, on board, and if they have anything they want to say, um, we can certainly give them the mic as well. No questions, Dawn? Joe, I'm not seeing any. Okay, I'm just gonna stop this.
I just like to say that I really appreciate all of you coming on tonight for one last opportunity for us to share the budget with you before um, Saturday morning. Um, and I hope that uh, to see you all there. And I hope that this runs very smoothly for all of us to um, to approve a budget to take us into 2024. Uh, Joe, there is a question that just came in. Just to get a clarification, if a church does not have a pastor that is enrolled in the benefits, do they still pay in? They do not. Uh, our current situation is that we do not um, charge a composite rate or a, um, a waiver fee uh, for clergy for the um, for the healthcare portion. There is a mandatory healthcare piece that's somewhere around um, $450, I think, per church, per person now. Um, and that covers um, a life insurance plan, an employee um, assistance plan. Uh, when we went to HealthFlex, um, HealthFlex has a, an EAP plan as part of its um, uh, package, um, but you only get that if you're enrolled in their healthcare. And we wanted to make sure that everyone um, who's a part of EPA has an opportunity to be in an employee assistance plan. So we kept a standalone plan as well. That's what that pays for. The next question, Joe, is how will this work with smaller churches to get up to speed or is the expectation to go to 100% payments in full within the year? Oh my goodness. We're praying for a miracle that everyone will be 100% paid. But we know that um, course correction takes a little bit of time. We understand that. So, um, you know, I believe in a God of grace. And so uh, that's the way we're going to operate. We'll do the best that we can to to give you the tools to, um, to be paid in full. Uh, the next question, it was mentioned quickly and I may have missed it, but what are the billing uncollectible and apportionment uncollectible line items again? You mean you want to see them or you want to know what they mean? I I sense they want to know where they are in the budget. Scott, okay. if you want to put any clarity to your question, feel free to do so. Oh, he said, you no, know, what does th what do they mean? What do they mean, Joe? Oh, Thanks. okay. So um the uncollectibles are things that we build out to local churches that just haven't been paid. So especially for billing, this is a problem because this is something that the conference has to pay. We don't allow um, a, a pastor's pension not to be paid. We don't allow their health insurance not to be paid or their property and liability. We don't want you to be able to lose that coverage in any way. And so the conference pays it whether we get collected or not. That's what that uncollectible piece is. Just, just to further uh, clarify, what it means is that other churches are paying on behalf of those churches that are not paying. And it is also the same with the apportionments. So, you know, we have to still pay the electric bill. We still have to pay staff and benefits and all those sorts of things that uh, go along with uh, running and doing the mission of the annual conference. So even on the um, apportionment side, when they're not paid, actually other churches are making that up. And I think, you know, Joe is right. We want to work with every church, help every church get on a plan uh, to begin to, you know, move toward uh, full payment on each of these. And so, you know, it's, the superintendents and I have been talking about how do we work with congregations to help them move in that direction. That might relate, Bishop, to the next question. Uh, what procedures are we using to collect the uncollectibles? <laughs> Yeah, well, we don't have bill collectors and uh, we don't send people around. We don't put you on a list. Um, one of the things you should know is that the cabinet um, always prays for all of our congregations and particularly prays for congregations that are struggling. We don't believe there's any congregation out there that doesn't want to pay 100%. We actually believe all of our congregations want to pay 100%. And that, you know, we're ready to work uh, with congregations. Um, you'll see 
um, you know, as during the close of this year, there will be some reminders of where your church is and, you know, what it needs to close that gap. Um, and then also in the church conference report forms, there is a question about, you know, this is what you paid previously, what percentage you paid, what's your goal for the next year? So, you know, let's say just for conversation's sake, um, a congregation paid 50% of their uh, billings. That would include uh, property insurance, healthcare insurance, um, and uh, pension for their, their clergy person. They paid 50%. So we would want to work with you to get on a plan. You know, so what does it look like to maybe move to 65% in the next year? and then move another 15%, and then another 15%. Um, that's the kind of thing that we would like to do and work with people is just to make progress. Um, so, you know, we want to be faithful to each other. We want to be faithful to God. And we want to particularly be faithful to the congregations that are trying to make it work as well. Joe, can you give an example of a fund that would have a 5% draw on it towards the budget? Sure. So there are several um, funds that are connected for it. I'm, I'm going to use uh, Board of Be Benefits because that's my uh, background. Um, there are several funds there, um, one of which is our main fund has um, almost six million dollars in it, um, supposed to be used for um, retirees. And so um, the pre-82 is now funded at 105 percent. So that's a huge congratulations out to the local churches for um, getting us to that point. But now we have this fund that um, should be used to help support our local churches. So 5% of a draw on that will help to fund the uncollectibles in the benefits area. And, you know, each one of the ministries, like for instance, camping, there are some camping funds and we want to raise more money uh, for camping uh, to put into those funds. And so those will be taken at a 5% draw. I think it's important to understand why a 5% roll or a 4% roll, you know, which is generally the, what, what, uh, you know, is done when you have these funds. And that's because you, you don't want to deplete the funds. You want the funds to continue to grow. And generally on average over a 20 year period of time, uh, investments grow uh, 7%. So as you can see, if you take 5% or 4%, that means over a period of time, two to 3% more is going into those funds. And that helps with inflation. It helps um, you know, to continue to grow the funds so that the funds just aren't stuck at a particular amount. So you know, just by way of uh, a conversation, let's just say you know, it, it, a fund is $100,000. Well, a 5% draw would be $5,000. So if that fund continues to grow, that 5,000 that you give away will continue to grow. But if you spend all of everything that the fund makes, then 10 years from now, 20 years from now, you're still gonna be giving away $5,000. And $5,000 is gonna be worth a lot less in five, 10, 15, 20 years. And so you're really trying to grow the fund. So I hope that makes some sense in terms of why there is a four to five percent draw, and also um, that these various funds, and they're listed in the legislation. You can go through them. You'll see all the different funds and where they actually go to. So read the descriptions of those funds, and you'll actually see, you know, where the money goes and how it's used. And you can also see the goals that we have set for yeah um, for each of these funds. So um, it's our intention to increase those funds over time. Right. Yeah, and, and the, part the, the funds can get increased in a number of ways. One, there can be contributions to them, and the, those contributions are always welcome. And then, you know, also we recognize that there are some churches that have lived out their life cycle and that they just don't have enough members and, and givers to sustain their mission and ministry. And so those churches close. Now what we're saying, when those churches close, how do we take the money from the, that, from the sale of that church and invest it into the future ministries 
of Eastern Pennsylvania. And so those funds will be dispersed throughout those various funds. Um, so the funds will grow in two ways. One, with uh, continued growth uh, through uh, market. And then the second is through the sale of, of property. There is a question related to the funds. Would any restricted funds go towards the uncollectibles? Um, only if this restriction allows that. Right. So you can't spend restricted funds on anything but what the donor restricted the funds for. So if it's a restricted fund, it can only go to that purpose. And again, with each fund, it has a listing of what the purpose is. So uh, we will not spend any restricted funds where there's not uh, the ability and permission to spend those funds. We honor what donors, uh, the, the wishes of donors. There's a question um, related to the data in ARENA. I'm just going to read it, Joe. Um, it says, speaking of charge conference forms and what was paid previously or other data that auto filled in ARENA, we know that the billables paid are inaccurate for our church, upwards of 25%. How can we get this corrected? Or how and when will more accurate statistics be uploaded, especially as arena stats will then automatically be utilized for grant application purposes? So when are the corrections going to be made in arena that we are very aware of that inaccurate information went out? Yeah. So um, as far as the statistics in ARENA, there's a couple things. Um, one is that it, they were inaccurately put into our previous system. And so when it moved over, it moved over inaccurate data. So we're working on uh, correcting that. We also had churches who didn't complete their statistics. And so 2019 data was put into the system to take the place of data that was not input by your local church. Um, if you know that there is a uh, an error, um, just please let us know. Um, you can send an email to me. You can send an email to Lawrence at the um, office, and we'll try and get it corrected as quickly as possible. Um, the, you know, we're working with like 800 churches now um, and trying to get that data in as, as accurately and as quickly as possible. Um, and so it, I'm just going to ask for your grace and patience um, as we get this all oriented and put it in into the system correctly. Just, um, you know, give us the data and we'll try and do it for you. The next question. Gotta love dogs. Um, the next question with regards to the sale of property. Forgive me. Will the conference be looking to close local churches? With regards to the sale of property, will the conference be looking to close local churches? I think I'll give that to the bishop. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, no, we don't look to close churches. Uh, and we also recognize that when churches year after year after year after year are not paying their billables, not paying their apportionments, it means other churches are paying for them. And it's just not fair to other churches. So what we always do is we work with a congregation uh, to make progress. And uh, one of the, you know, we've been working on and uh, working with churches on two different um, reports about the church. One is its vitality. How well is it engaging its people in ministry and mission? and the life of the church. The second is sustainability. Uh, sustainability is how are you financially positioned to sustain your congregation and your mission? And what we look at in terms of sustainability is um, how churches in terms of the number of worshipers and what also their budget is, how much they're paying for different things. And so it's like any of us with our, our, our home budget. Um, if we're living above our means, we have to make adjustments and um, we have to make those adjustments so that we can pay all of our, our uh, commitments. And so, you know, that would be the first look that we would always take is um, 
you know, our church is living above their means. And then how can we help them get to a place where they can manage their budget, manage their mission and ministry? Um, the other is m- many of the churches that we're working with that are not sustainable generally have anywhere from five to 10 to 15, maybe 20 worshipers. And so they've gotten so small and some of them still have sanctuaries that seat hundreds of people. And so the building is too big. They can't keep up with it. Um, And many of these churches are not actually willing to make the change to get into a smaller building or to do other things, rent facilities, uh, do other things to generate income so that they can sustain their building and also uh, pay their billings. So it's, it's, we're not looking to close churches. We don't close churches. Um, The annual conference closes churches, congregations close churches. And uh, that happens when a congregation gets so small that it really is not able to sustain itself. And um, the majority of the time, it's the congregation that recognizes we've just gotten to a place that we can't uh, continue to move forward. So we want to close. Members want to go to other churches. And so we help them work with them on that. But um, what we are encouraging is, you know, the sustainability has a, um, a rating of one through five. Uh, five is highly sustainable, and then four, three, and then one and two are in jeopardy. And we want to do everything we can to move twos up to threes. And so before you get to a one, if you're at a two, you should be reaching out to us and saying, hey, we need to talk about this because we're afraid that if we'll get to one and then we won't be able to turn it around. So we're working with you. We're trying to present information that helps you understand it. Um, and catch it before it becomes a problem. There were just two follow-up questions, but I think you hit on the bishop. One, though, in particular was, is uh, the congregation's mission and ministry in the community taken into consideration as well? And um, does this pertain to smaller churches? Um, You know, can there be a healthy small church? Would you just speak to that? Oh, yeah. We have a lot of healthy small churches. I mean, we have churches that have 10 to 15 worshipers, but they're very healthy um, in terms of their mission and ministry in the community um, and also sustaining their their church. Some of these churches had smart people a long time ago who said, we need to put money away uh, so that if the church does get smaller, there's money to help sustain it. And so they've done that. So, yes, we do. And then also from time to time, there are churches that are very strategic to the life and mission of the annual conference. Um, These might be in a particular strategic location. Um, It might be a congregation with a particular strategic ministry or mission. Um, So there can be a variety of things also that we would look at. And again, the best thing is if, you know, if you're in sustainability three, two, or, or one, you should be reaching out to talk to us. Threes, you want to, you know, strengthen that a little bit so that maybe you can get to a four. Twos, you want to get up to three. Ones, you really need to look seriously at what's happening and, you know, what what is your legacy going forward. There's a comment, um, just celebrating the proposed salary increase for the staff in 2024, and also to have an investment in the budget for a health and wellness fair. And then a final question, Um, Bishop, wasn't there legislation passed in this year's annual conference that gave the cabinet the the ability to close churches in, I'm going to get this wrong, exigent circumstances? Oh, you got it right. That's good. Yes, but that was uh, in particular for congregations that were refusing appointments uh, that the cabinet and bishop were making. And uh, we, exigent circumstances are very serious kinds of situations and conditions. Um, The church, you know, has left the denomination, changed their signboard, 
you know, we have a trust clause. And so, you know, that's when we have to move to, you know, close the church um, and uh, take the, those steps. The other is refusing an appointment. So it's really very um, significant issues. Sometimes we actually have uh, congregations that just cease to exist. They're, they just say, you know, we're, we're, we're done. Um, you know, here are the keys. Well, we still, by discipline, have to close that church. And so that would be also exigent circumstances. There's just nobody left uh, with the congregation. Another question came in. How does the budget forecast for disaffiliated churches um, and potential lower apportionments? I, I sense the question is, will that impact the apportionment, Joe? Uh, so yes, it will uh, in, impact the apportionments. Um, they go down over, over the years. Um, but we are trying to make sure that we're in a place where um, we, first of all, we have funds that we can draw from to help pay for operating costs so that that's, so, so that the money that's coming in is actually used for um, mission and ministry in the local conf in the uh, local church. Um, and, and we're trying to plan for healthier uh, local churches. And we're also looking at um, our benefits, we can't do a lot with our benefits because it's a denominational plan, uh, but we will be putting our property and liability out for bid to make sure that we're getting uh, appropriate um, costs for those kinds of things um, and, you know, planning for the future in that way. And CFA has uh, looked out, you know, what, what, what we have is what's called an apportionment base. That's the spending of a local church minus its capital expenditures and its mission expenditures. And uh, that gives us the base. And we add all that together. We see what the conference apportionment base is. Well, we've deducted out of the base for 2024 and going forward, the churches that are, dis that are, that are disaffiliating. So we've, we've recognized that that's coming. And so we've already prepared as we look to 24, 25, 26, and that we are really moving and right-sizing uh, to uh, the five churches that have disaffiliated. So, you know, that's, that's where we're moving. That's what we've done. And um, as I recall, uh, and Joe, you should uh, correct me, but it's somewhere around $500,000 of apportionments that we're losing through the disaffiliations. That's correct. Uh, so, you know, that we've recognized and we have begun to prepare 2024, 25, 26 and following uh, to address that. So, you know, as it, overall, as the annual conference, um, you should know that your leaders uh, recognize that, understand that and are planning and budgeting for that already. There are not any open questions at this time. Okay. Well, again, thank you for coming out this evening. I'm gonna ask um, Reverend Dawn if she would please pray us out. Are there any final words, Steve or Bishop, that you wanna share? No? Uh, I just wanna say, we're just so grateful for not only your being here, but also your uh, commitment to the life and ministry and mission of Eastern Pennsylvania and for the United Methodist Church. And uh, God's got great future for ahead of us. And I think the steps that are being taken now in terms of our budgeting, uh, what CFA is working on, what all the agencies have been working on um, is the right next thing for us. And as I say, God's got a great future ahead for us. We give thanks. Let's pray, friends. God of abundance, we thank you that you're the God that saves the best for last. You're the God that provides water in the desert. You're the God that brings life and light out of darkness. So we thank you. We praise you. I thank you for these leaders who um, are ready uh, to serve you, congregations that are engaged in mission and ministry and ready to plant trees for the next generations. Bless um, 
not only this conversation, but as we move into holy conferencing, that you will be present, that your Holy Spirit will guide us, and that we will seek your voice and your way forward for your people. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank <clears throat> you.